You haven't been petting other cats, have you? This video contains spoilers. In Sound Mind is an odd little indie game that stood out to me in ways most AAA titles of late have not been able to do. Its developers managed this arcane task by engaging in a forbidden art that much of the malformed misery that is the current entertainment industry dares not attempt. They didn't base narrative and production decisions entirely on profit. I know. I too am blown away. So, what's In Sound Mind about? The concept simple enough. Psychologist Desmond Wales wakes up in the basement of an apartment building, soon realizing that everything is not as it appears when he starts coming across puddles of psychedelic hippie juice leaking from oil drums and other strange oddities. As the game continues on, he eventually finds his way into the psychic landscapes of four of his former patients, uncovering more about them as he fights his way through the twisted reflections of their trauma, all while he tries to figure out why he's in this situation in the first place, and getting emotionally suplexed by a Kruger clone with such force that his self-esteem punches deep enough into the ground to get incinerated by the Earth's core. Hey Desi, it's your Aunt Rose! Your mother told me you got a cat, and I just wanted to let you know that it's perfectly natural for you to be an utter embarrassment that will end up dying alone. Trust me, as a fellow cat person, once you get one of those, society has zero expectations for you. To some of you, this all might sound kind of familiar. Do you remember Alan Wake? In Sound Mind is clearly influenced by it, what with its creepy atmosphere laced with quirky humor that is punctuated by surreal artistic decisions, slashes of energetic music, and uh, okay action. It even insists that it's a horror game, despite that being very far removed from the truth. Kinda like when you were told as a kid that it was illegal to have the lights on in the car while driving at night. Lorelai and Bruno had fallen, and my team and I were in unknown territory as we confronted Agatha and her undead abominations. We held a superior position, but the sun was setting, clouding the battlefield in darkness. My hand acted on reflex as it flicked on the backseat light to cut through the obscuring darkness and keep the tides of battle in our favor. But that moment I had to look away cost us. Haunter licked Mule, paralyzing him with fear. I considered as I formulated a strategy before finally setting on a plan of retaliation, but that was when tragedy reared its ugly head. Uncle Maddox called to me from the front seat and told me to turn off the light. I tried to reason with him, but ultimately failed in the face of his dire warning. It's against the law to have the lights on in the car at night. The police will pull us over if you don't turn it off. I had no choice but to comply. Now plunged in darkness, there was only the passing lights of the outside world to see by. I bided my time, waiting for the windows of illumination to continue providing tactical support. Time seemed to stretch on forever as my team and I managed to push through to our final obstacle, Gengar. Fortunately, we had it outgunned and outnumbered. Victory was assured and the ability to save and recuperate waited just beyond that terrible grin dripping with inhumane malice but fate had other plans. I'm sorry, Jolteon, Mule, Brian, Metapod, Pidgeotto, but most of all, I'm sorry to you, Blastoise. Your efforts and the blood you all paid for a chance at victory made meaningless by the sins of my father's brother. But I swear, we will have revengeance. That's Accepting that the similarities are not accidental and the developers were trying to go for a similar feel to Alan Wake, In Sound Mind does occasionally get a bit lost in the wake sauce and sometimes fails to incorporate everything properly in that pursuit, which is never more apparent than those moments when the humor veers off into the upsetting OMG guys, I'm so random zone, making me feel like if I cringed any harder into my seat I might involuntarily implode like a collapsing star. This type of humor didn't work for me because it didn't add anything. Unlike the majority of jokes and attempts at humor in Alan Wake that grabbed my attention in a positive way due to how they added to the overall weirdness and mystery of the game. Only the free fatty acids are good for your heart. 
Why did he say that? Is there a lore reason he's giving me health advice? I still remember that line one decade later because of how bizarre and intriguing it was, all while not seeming too out of place. Unlike a certain psychologist in his 30s trapped in a nightmare world uttering nom, nope, nom, nom, when he eats food. It reeks of early 2010s internet humor and it just doesn't fit with the rest of the game. Now I hear some of you thinking, hey man, calm your tits and stop projecting. <laughs> And I have to say I'm hurt by that assertion. Segway. The music for this game was composed by The Living Tombstone, and most of it is good at setting the mood and is well done. Until you hear the musical vignettes made for each character. The reason for this is because listening to the lyrics of these songs feels like a shovel to the face because of how on the nose and blunt they are. The only exception to this is Lucas's song, Me and the Boys. Because while there are moments when the lyrics are nose adjacent, they at least don't feel so awkward or ham-fisted. Let's take a quick listen for comparison. Harrison. Me and the boys going round and singing praises no one will hear. Got a box full of toys and memorabilia. It feels kind of odd. Why? I'm flashing, I'm flashing back. Everyone's crashing. But as long as we're together Believe it now, believe it then As long as you believe it when It comes knocking, it comes knocking for your friends Grinding the mighty Though nothing's wrong scary when I'm alone It's a little bit dark outside when I'm uptight I call you on the phone When we hang up I stay awake for a while Wondering if what you say is true Hey, it's me from the future. While I was editing this affront to critical thought, I had to listen to the soundtrack over and over again while I was trying to make smooth transitions between tracks. And after a while, I actually started to like the character songs. It's true they made a very bad first impression, but after a few listens, they started to become strangely endearing in their dramatic depictions of the characters and their relationship with Desmond. So, uh, fuck me. Maybe I was being a hypercritical dipshit. Or maybe I'm suffering from musical Stockholm Syndrome. You decide! Speaking of characters, they were endearing and kept my attention with their amazing voice acting and interesting personalities, especially Desmond's former patients, Virginia, Alan, Max, and Lucas. Each of them portrayed a different mental illness, and I have to say I'm proud of this game for not going overboard in that portrayal. In fact, I'd say it was pretty respectful for the most part, which is something a lot of TV shows, movies, video games, and books can't help but fuck up. Oh ho ho ho! Everyone will be sorry after I kill myself. They'll be crushed by guilt and haunted by a manifestation of their regret for not treating me better, which of course will take the shape of me! <laughs> I'm not opposed to jokes about people being unhinged and mental illness in general, but I do draw the line at shit like that because it glamorizes it and is meant to be taken seriously. It's kinda gross and boring. So seeing mental illness discussed in a way more closely aligned with reality is good to see, and makes me respect the developers for it. To illustrate what I'm talking about, let's take a look at the first of Desmond's former patients, Virginia. Beginning with a winding road leading to what looks to be a department store drifting in a never-ending ocean of hippie juice, you find what look to be recordings of her therapy sessions with Desmond. It's just sad, you know? It's not fair. I've been getting food and stuff from Eden's Grove for like my whole life. They expect me to just be okay with them ruining this town and forcing me to shop at their place? 
This makes me really sad. Am I crazy? I am crazy, right? No. Changes like these can be uncomfortable. Eden's Grove was certainly a staple of the community. Inside the creepy rundown department store, you come across mirrors, a new tool in the shape of a shard from a broken mirror, and a group of the most endearing mannequins I've ever seen. I love them all equally, and I'm invested in them in a way bordering on infatuation. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. And of course, there also appears to be the ghost of Virginia roaming the aisles, who you can ward away by tricking into looking at her reflection. As you creep along, you'll be able to find hidden messages scrawled all over the place by Virginia whenever you look around through the bit of broken mirror. These messages appear to reflect the way she views herself, that she's a monster, how nobody will love her, and different variations of how she's bad in one way or another. She can also be heard whenever she's near, pleading with Desmond to not look at her and to leave her alone. These two things are constant throughout the area and help to paint a picture of Virginia and her baggage. Then, after continuing on, solving some puzzles and finding some lore, what happened to her begins to unfold, revealing that she killed herself in the department store. Now, I do think that this is a bit dramatized, but I still don't think it's romanticizing her mental illness. At no point are there any implications of what she went through being anything other than it was painful and not glamorous. Anyways, after Desmond finishes up in the store, he makes his way back to the apartment building, finding new recordings to fully illustrate Virginia's backstory on the way. So, like I said, the way she died is a bit dramatized, but overall, I feel that this depiction of someone struggling with mental illness through the lens of Virginia's personality disorder, NOS, was more or less grounded and pointedly not idealized. Not only do I like this because it isn't directly perpetuating bad ideas about emotionally leveraging mental illness against others, but it's also easier to relate to, or at least sympathize with, which I think is pretty cool. But what I don't think is cool is the AI in this game. What the fuck, guys? Did nobody ever jump on top of a car during playtesting? Is this scenario too outlandish to warrant some extra beef on the generic enemy's AI? And why are there only three types of non-boss enemies anyway? There's this one, a ranged version of it, and a gorilla. It made combat with the enemies uninteresting, and after you've seen them all, which is about halfway through the game, it makes the combat pretty shit. As for the actual shooting, there's not a lot to say about it. It was fine, I guess. But if I had to describe it, it was functional and got the job done, just like the Half-Life 2 mods of old. Which isn't too surprising, considering who the developers are. We Create Stuff used to make Half-Life 2 mods back in the day, and one of them was actually pretty good. But for some reason, despite them having made In Sound Mind with the Unity engine, there's a lot of janky aspects that feel similar to Half-Life 2 mods beyond the combat. The mod tendencies even permeated the narrative. One of the things I really liked about the ye olde mods was how the developers prized doing whatever the hell they wanted for their plots over appealing to as many people as possible. However, sometimes that did result in some pretty off-putting shit. Using a government conspiracy about psychedelic mushroom beetle juice that mentally connects people to the collective unconscious was way too tryhard in the writing department. All it did was distract from the characters, which is what people care about most in games like this. Part of the reason why Virginia's area is the best is because it mostly focuses entirely on her, instead of shifting attention in favor of some bullshit about the shady dealings of the not-CIA. This is something that progressively gets worse the more the game goes on. For instance, the third area is about a guy named Max with anger management issues, and while the manifestation of his destructive anger is well done, pretty much every Everything else was about the government conspiracy and their mushroom beetle juice, with the only exception being some notes about him getting fired and some recordings before and after Desmond goes into his zone. Everybody's trying to upend my life here, trying to ruin my marriage, take my kid away and turn her against me. Next is what? You want to take away my rights? My freedom? Tell you what, why don't you give me them pills you're probably paid to give out and I'll pretend like I take them so I can go home. I'm a therapist, Max, not a psychiatrist. I don't prescribe medication. I am here to help. Why not go into more detail about his relationship with his daughter? Or maybe talk about his past and try to explain how he got this way in the first place? Did you really need to talk about the mushroom beetle juice so much? To be clear though, I'm not saying to have no overarching plot. No, the problem is giving it so much explanation that it becomes the focus. Keeping it in the background or just saying it's fucking magic would have been the way to go, because that would allow the game to put more focus on the characters and even allow for more time to expand on them, like it could have done for Desmond. 
for most of the game, Desmond's personality comes off as an everyman with hints of vulnerability sprinkled in occasionally. It's clear he cares for his patients and feels guilty about their fates, but there isn't really much talk about him beyond that until the very end of the game, when he gains access to a locked room in his apartment. And that sucks, because that peek into his emotional luggage is a touching and distilled example of what makes this game stand out to me. You can feel that it came from a genuine and heartfelt place on the part of the developers. I don't want to spoil what's in there, but I will say that it's something I feel anyone can relate to on one level or another. As I keep repeating like a broken record, a lot of effort and care went into in Soundmind, which I feel is one of the base requirements for something to be considered good. However, as I outlined in my incessant whining, it was also by no means a perfect game. But as you can probably guess by the frequency with which I fillet this game because of its sincerity, those negative aspects did not push heavily enough upon the scales of quality to outweigh its charming execution. So is in Soundmind good? Yes. Wait a minute here. There's a talking cat. Desmond's patient's areas and their bosses are twisted reflections of their memories and feelings. You shoot shadowy looking monsters. There's moments of psychological angst and extremely cringy humor. This game isn't like Alan Wake. It's like Blaz Blue. But mostly it's like Persona 5. I'll see myself out now. Yeah.